Hello, and welcome to the arbitration conversation. So in this arbitration conversation, we're going to talk to a leader in international arbitration and investment treaty arbitration, also an authority and scholar with respect to renewable energy and this intersection of arbitration and renewable energy. So Paul Barker is our guest today. Paul is a barrister um, with Doherty Street London. Also, he is part of the Stanford. He is a research fellow at Stanford as well, looking at this intersection of arbitration and renewable energy. So Paul, first of all, I just wanna thank you so much for taking time. Thank you so much for having me. So this is a pretty specialized area. And before we sort of get into this nexus of looking at renewable energy and how it intersects with intersects with arbitration. Could you just explain a little bit more about the field in general and what we're sort of looking at with respect to renewable energy? Sure, yeah. Well, to set the scene, I, I personally find renewable energy in the sector to be this fascinating mix of technology and innovation, finance and, and public policy. And we're, we're, of course, living through a renewable energy revolution that's, that's having a transformative impact on on both the, the global economy and, and our environment. So we have solar, wind, uh, hydropower generation now, cheaper than fossil fuels in, in markets around the world. Uh, the solar is, the, uh, cost has come down about 80% uh, utility scale solar in, in 10 years. Um, and I think in that context, it's, in, it's important to remember, and, it, and it's also very relevant to international arbitration, uh, that, that public policy and, and regulation have been central to the, the development of renewable energy as a commercially viable business model. Uh, governments have, have often very successfully uh, incentivized investors to take risks on uh, expensive new renewables technologies. They have high upfront capital expenditures. Um, so it's thanks to this um, private sector innovation backed by public support, uh, such as feed and tariffs in, in Europe and Asia or, or tax credits here in the US, um, the renewals are now competitive. Uh, but that said, for, there are various reasons why policy port will remain very, very important, uh, given the sheer scale of the renewable energy transition that's, that's needed to achieve carbon neutrality. Um, and, and on that note, I, I, I sort of mentioned that the, the expansion in renewables has also been accelerated by, by the growth in sustainable finance and, and ESG investing. And this is helping to further drive down uh, renewable projects' cost of capital. Um, but the, the big picture, of course, um, is how renewable energy is closely linked with international climate change policy. Um, and, and certainly the, the 2015 Paris Agreement has been instrumental. We finally have something like a global consensus that, that de decarbonisation has to happen very quickly um, if we're going to keep temperature rises to, to one and a half degrees uh, Celsius. Right. Well, and I guess that's a perfect segue. You know, we're seeing this um, talking about sort of the role of arbitration, but then also your work. I'm thinking about your work at Stanford, looking at this intersection of investment treaty arbitration and how that intersects with the Paris Agreement. Yeah, so at Stanford, certainly, I mean, the renewable energy, climate change has, has implications at the international commercial arbitration level, um, at the, the interstate arbitration level, you know, you have these uh, you had in, in 2013 the, the permanent court of arbitration uh, case between Pakistan and India over a, a hydro project and, and cross boundary river rights. So there, so there are lots of areas of arbitration, commercial investment treaty, interstate, where where these where climate change and renewables are relevant. But the the issue I'm I'm interested in at the moment is essentially uh, this, and that is to meet. Paris Agreement targets, we're going to have to increase annual investment in decarbonization um, of the economy by, by trillions of dollars a year. And that's a, a huge investment gap. There's not enough public money to do this. Um, uh, so private investment has to provide the lion's share. Uh, and given that a lot of the, the green projects around the world are going to be um, in the developing world, um, foreign direct investment is, is inevitably going to be a big part. 
So as, a, as an investment treaty lawyer, my mind therefore turns to how investment treaties could be used to help encourage uh, all this green investment. Um, you know, after all, investment treaties are supposed to promote foreign investment. Um, so how do we use treaties to direct capital flows uh, into climate friendly uh, investments? Um, and, and frankly, the short answer is it, it's complex because investment treaties are, are climate neutral um, in the sense they don't distinguish between investments that are high carbon um, or low carbon. Um, and at the moment, barely any investment treaties out there even mention climate change uh, or the Paris Agreement, um, you know, let alone provide any guidance as to how the standards of investment protection might relate to, to climate change law or policy. Um, and I, I think it's interesting to compare the situation with the investment treaty system with, say, the, the new taxonomy regulation in Europe, which is going to require banks and asset managers and, and companies to, to categorize economic activities as, as either environmentally sustainable or not and, and the idea is this will help the market properly properly price climate risk and it will also uh, encourage uh, capital flows into sustainable investments um, but the you know the problem with arbitration is that um, these issues haven't really addressed been addressed and then and in the meantime climate related treaty claims have really skyrocketed over the past decade there are, there are a few from uh, fossil fuel investors um, complaining about phase outs of, of, of coal plants and the like, but by, by far the largest number are from um, renewable energy investors uh, concerning cuts or cancellations to renewable energy subsidies. Right. Well, and you think about alignment and sort of maybe outside experts, would that come into play at all when you think about how to best sort of align um, investment treaty arbitration? in this way? Yeah, well, certainly I think one of the, one of the advantages of, of arbitration is, is its procedural flexibility and, and, and the ability to bring in experts uh, with, uh, with us or bring in scientific and, and other expertise. And you can do that through, uh, including through you know, arbitrators with, with climate related backgrounds. Um, so I think certainly investment treaty arbitration is well set up for that. Um, but there is, I mean, I, I think the, there's a, a kind of a broader uh, policy issue, which is, you know, is alignment best achieved by ensuring states have enough policy state uh, space um, to regulate in the, in the public interest on climate change matters. And that, and that might include measures that cut subsidies. Or uh, alternatively, is, is uh, alignment better achieved by ensuring uh, regulatory stability um, to renewable energy investors um, so that you reduce their risks and, and in the process you, you help host states hit their net zero um, ambitions with all of this new renewable energy investment. Um, and those are quite difficult questions currently being considered in in uh, the, the um, ongoing negotiations uh, to modify the Energy Charter Treaty, which is an important treaty in this in this area, um, but it is, as I say, it, it's um, there are no there are no simple solutions. Right, right. Well, it sounds like um, sort of we all have to really kind of wrap our brains around creative problem solving because it's an important issue. Um, so we need to think about ways to address it. You know, it also brings me to sort of what you see on the ground in terms of trends. Um, recent trends with renewable energy and arbitration. Um, what have you seen? Yeah, so, I mean, as, as I mentioned just now, that certainly claims concerning climate-related policies um, and, and regulations are going to continue to feature heavily in investment treaty arbitration. Um, and those claims that will come from both uh, renewable energy investors and fossil fuel investors. Um, but then also climate change, I think, will increasingly become relevant to international commercial arbitration disputes. Um, most, most obviously, contracts directly related to deep decarbonization efforts um, to mitigate or adapt to climate change, so renewable energy products, projects. And, and you, know, you see the, the scale of these new offshore wind turbines that are, that are the size of skyscrapers, you know, 85 stories 
high and you appreciate the, the sheer complexity of these, these projects. Um, so there's a range, a range of, of disputes that can arise there so concerning energy supply, power purchase agreements that can involve state entities, um, IP uh, uh, disputes over, over new, uh, the licensing of new uh, renewable technology. So there, there's a full array of disputes that can arise in the commercial context um, related to climate um, change mitigation projects. But, but, but also there can be, um, you can have commercial arbitration over contracts that on the face of it have nothing to do with climate change. Um, but uh, for example, there ends up being a, a dispute over um, the, a physical risk of climate change. You know, there's a flood or there's a wildfire and it harms business. Um, and you also have transitional risks of climate change that may crop up in, in commercial disputes, you know, if, a, if an environment, environmental regulation or, a, or an emissions target is, is set by the government that, that impacts a business, how is that risk allocated in, in the context of a commercial relationship? Um, so there's, there's a, a very broad range of issues that can arise in arbitration, which don't necessarily have to be connected with um, a, a you know a renewable energy project, but but may um, involve climate risks to some degree. Um, and as you say, that the the beauty of arbitration is that there is flexibility to bring in scientific expertise and and uh, and also if the if the rules and the governing law allows um, to take account of relevant public policy and, and international law um, issues, including including under the Paris Agreement. Um, and, you know, I, I think also uh, the, the fact is that the, the personnel in, in international arbitration are well suited um, to this, this kind of subject matter and, and the overlap between uh, commercial law, public international law, regulatory law. Um, so, so all in all, I think it's, uh, it's a system that will, will adapt, but, it, but it's well, um, well placed to do so. Yeah, I would agree with that for sure. And I see even in the area of construction um, arbitration, for example, you might have um, issues that touch on environment as well. So it's definitely an area where arbitration seems as though it's flexible enough, can bring in sufficient expertise, um, really an important issue and will be interesting to watch how things develop in this space. Certainly will. Well, thank you, Paul, for taking time with us today. I really appreciate it. And um, I hope that we'll perhaps run into you again on the arbitration conversation. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me.